bum 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 Yeah. With all kinds of sticks, with a with a TV antenna, with just a random pole for some reason. So we've seen that movie a couple times at home on Blu-ray, right? DVD, VHS, pick your uh, format. And then I just sit there while Brad goes, imagine that coming out at you. And there are sequences in that movie where it's obvious that it's 3D. Like Jason, you know, reaching his hands out, trying to grab the girl while an ax is embedded in his head. Clearly that is a 3D moment. But when you actually watch it in 3D, you see all the other ridiculous non-threatening 3D moments where there's like a shovel there and you said like the TV antenna like that TV antenna comes early in the movie and I literally had to like swat it out of my face while watching it last night. I feel like they got tired of their own gimmick <laughs> before they had finished the movie uh-huh. and so by the time Jason was killing people I feel like I was like I expect more like stabby stabby at the screen I'm expecting more spurty blood at the screen but I feel like they all just got tired. Was there an absolutely freaky moment with the 3D that shocked the hell out of you last night. Yeah, I did have one real jump. Oh, uh, when the guy fell down uh, from being hanged. Uh huh. Yeah, oh, that oh. really made me jump. That was yeah. like a jump scare for and, me. Well, that was a jump scare, but it also not necessarily like the best 3D scare. Yeah. To me, it was in that early sequence when that snake jettisons oh, yeah. out of its little hidey hole right into your face. Like I literally lunged oh, while no. I was drinking a watermelon mezcal margarita and I spilled a little on myself. And it was clearly just like a rubber snake. Terrible, on a... terrible snake. But but really shocking. Really shocking. To me, the scariest thing about Friday the 13th, part three in 3D is uh, the grocery store clerk like (laughs) casually drinking out of the orange juice and putting the lid back on and putting it on and him being like so greasy. Yeah. It was so, uh, so nasty. And then immediately going to the outhouse and having the most like audible bowel movement. Yeah, it was disgusting. (laughs) I had so much fun with that movie though. And I agree that this is the type of 3D that I want in my life. I know everyone is freaking out about Avatar The Way of Water right now and how immersive James Cameron's 3D is and that is true but I don't have fun with that 3D the way that I have fun with Friday the 13th part 3 in 3D and I feel a little left out of the Avatar celebration and I guess that's okay. Well you know we are lovers we are not we are not haters. If there's a, an enthusiasm choo-choo we want to get on that train and we feel lonely like left at the station and now because you are now a TV personality. Oh, yeah. You are now uh-huh. a spokesperson of cinema. 
Like you're a little bit, you have to be a little bit more responsible with your opinions, right? You're referring to the B&B show and I appreciate a plug of my new public <laughs> access show that I'm doing for Prince George's County Television. Available on YouTube, everyone can watch it. Link in the show notes. And we did just record our top 10 episode of the year and Avatar The Way of Water was most definitely not in my top 10. It was in Brian's top 10. And I had to like fight all my urge in my soul to like poo poo, to yuck his yum. Mm. <laughs> because like, like I just like instinctively just want to say why I don't like it. But that's not the, that's not the, the type of person we want to be. Like you're saying, we, we want to be celebrators. And if somebody is enjoying something like Avatar The Way of the Water, I want to let them enjoy it. Even though they're wrong. You're such an antagonist, Lisa. I love that. I'm not going to take that bait. Art is subjective. There is no right and wrong in what you love. But yeah, even though they're wrong. You know, the B&B show has just been such an incredibly exciting experience, but also maybe the most vulnerable thing I have ever done. Mm -hmm. The moment they turn those cameras on, my brain leaves my body. And I, 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 I just don't say the things that I want to be saying. I'm just saying things. And I know I'm going to get better on that show and people seem to like what I am doing there. We're going to continue making episodes this year. And you're only going to get better. I, I mean, like, that's the hope, right? Like, that's the hope. But I, I, like, I watch it and I just cringe. I am just so proud of you and proud of mm. what you're doing with the B&B &B show. I do think that you ha are destined to have a public access show. I just think that you're made for it. You're charismatic. You ha do have the IMDb brain where you know all of the But peoples. it goes away. And that was like one of the great frustrations recording this episode is I butchered and forgot a bunch of people's names. And mm. that just kills me. Whereas like on the podcast, if I'm like, oh, what's that uh, creator's name? I could rewind and then edit and mm -hmm. fix it. Yeah. On the public access show, we really only have a few hours to record the whole thing. So we don't get to do a lot of takes. And if you stumble on a person's name... Too bad. Brad and I are both like control freaks. Yes. <laughs> and we both have opinions on the way things should be done. And for Brad, this is really a relinquishment of that editing power. There is always the fear there that you say something that you cannot take back, which makes right. you hyper conscious and which is not, not good for conversation, but you're going to become more comfortable our last show, our, our podcast that we did before Comic Book Couples Counseling was not edited at all. And we got pretty comfortable doing that. I think also the video element adds another bit of chaos into the mix. Yes, because you have to be totally engaged with either Brian across from you at the table or with the camera itself. And that requires like a different part of my brain to work. But as my producer, Gina, said after our last record, Brad, don't worry about it. TV ain't clean. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, it's not something that has to be perfect. You don't have to sound flawless in your logic or in your speak. Uh, so relax. And uh, yeah, so even Gina knows that uh, I'm an anxious person now. <laughs> It is the new year. It's still January. And I think that I know that I personally am in a place where I'm looking to challenge myself so that I can get to the next level. And I I also do not like being on video. Right. And in previous interviews for Comic Book Couples Counseling, they've all been happening in Zoom rooms right. where interviewees can see us. So in the past, up until the beginning of this year, I have sat off camera right. while we interview just so I can hyper focus on the words because I do write out my questions and I have like a character list there because I am horrible with proper nouns. Like they just leave my head the second I become the least bit self-conscious. It's always been a situation where we've had to explain it to the person like, hey, Lisa is also on this interview, but you will not see her. Because, she's on the other side of the table. Because she's, she like, and I would sometimes just toss it off as like, I can't think with someone looking at me, which is true, <laughs> which, is, which is why I would sit off camera. So the next bunch of interviews, including this one, have been me 
sitting on camera while they're doing these interviews. And I feel like I'm feeling what you feel mm -hmm. when you do the B&B &B show, where like now that I'm on camera, part of my brain is occupied by do I look to this person that I'm paying attention? Do I look to this person that I am thoughtful? Is my chin tipped in a flattering fashion <laughs> so that this person knows how attractive I am in person? Like all of these other extra things yeah. that take up, you know, of course, 40% of my brain, because I'm an anxious person, is always being taken up by, you're not good enough. You are not going to fool this person that you are smart or clever or funny or whatever I'm trying to be in that moment. And so obviously what we're saying is that Lisa and I are going through this. I'm guessing a lot of people go through this. And what's important is that you just do it. And yeah. Since you've gotten on camera and we've sat next to each other doing these interviews, I do think that the interviews have become more engaging. And I think you are good on them, Lisa. Trust me. Um, I do trust you, but I also know that talking about the B&B &B show, you have said there is always like this extra level of embarrassment, like promoting it. Right. Because of your self-consciousness and you you going like, I'm promoting something that is not perfect. Not you know, perfect to my standard, yeah. which is maybe too high. Which it may be imaginary. Yes. Right. Well, my standard's not imaginary. Your standard, well, is something that's unattainable. Think of the words <laughs> of Neil Gaiman in his master class, uh, which is uh, what Brad's parents got me for for Christmas is a year of master class. Nothing in this universe is perfect. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that's not what he said. He said, perfect does not exist in this universe. Yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. And that feeds into what Matt Lesniewski said in one of our previous Creator Corner conversations about putting his work out into the world, knowing that it is also not perfect, but that's how every comic is. Every comic you read is not the perfect representation of what the creator thought. It, it in the best case scenario, it's what they could do by the deadline. Yeah, and that Their goes best work in the same for interviews, that goes the same for podcasts, that goes for the same for the B&B &B show episodes. Yeah, but it's hard for me to, you know, um, it it's hard for me to promote interviews where I'm like, I'm really excited I got to talk to this person, but I may be making a little goof of myself in front of these people that I admire. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're not making a goof of yourself. Certainly not in this episode. Yeah, this is great. And Kelly Thompson was so easy to talk to. And Meredith McLaren, equally so. Yes. And we have editing power. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, on the last, we, we have some interviews coming up about with creators behind Lazarus Planet. These are two interviews where um, I had this self-awareness to act a fool and embarrass myself, but then leave a pause. So the only person who knows that I'm a doof is Mark Wade. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay to be a doof in front of Mark Wade and others, including our listeners. Yeah. So what a great transition to this creator conversation with Kelly Thompson and Meredith McLaren talking about Black Cloak. We've been big Kelly Thompson fans for a long time. Uh, listeners may remember our episode on Rogue and Gambit talking about the Thompson miniseries. One of the most perfect miniseries for the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. It's Jeff is a life-affirming, delicious treat every time it drops on Marvel Unlimited. And we are crazy excited that we're going to get a physical copy of those short comics. We Yes. And our Thompson love brought us to Meredith McLaren thanks to their collaboration on Heart in a Box, which is a great comic currently available from Dark Horse Comics. So the idea of them re-teaming is very exciting, especially on a science fiction fantasy series like Black Cloak. Slash procedural, do not forget. No, absolutely. And like all our favorite comics, it's many genres wrapped up in one story. Lisa, why don't you just go ahead and read the plot synopsis off the Image website? Happy to. Blade Runner style mixes with saga-esque drama in a delectable fantasy sci-fi blend as two black cloaks try to solve the murder of a beloved prince in Kiros, the last city in the known world, before his murder tips the city into war. The mystery begins in a spectacular triple-length first issue. Pow, pow, pow. Just $4.99. And it is deal and a, steal. a massive single issue. It's how we like it, long and strong. And the issues that come after that are also quite thick. And uh, I like to get my hands around them. <laughs> <laughs> Going to keep that? Yeah. 
Okay, well, it was a delight to talk to both of these creators, and we do discuss that whole Blade Runner meets Saga thing. I can see why Image is latching onto Saga in its comparison with Black Cloak, but also I feel like Black Cloak is really doing something very different than what Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples are doing with their sci-fi romance. Honestly, I've been nurturing a little pet peeve about selling comics by comparing them to two other pieces of pop culture. Especially Saga, because Saga is so popular, you see that book coming up in log lines over and over and over again. And not everything can be Saga. And yeah. we don't need any more Saga because- We have Saga. Saga exists. So like, to me, how I would sell Black Cloak is that Last City idea, where you're taking all of these multifarious, fantasy, sci-fi cultures that you would think that are by necessity kind of self-canceling and pressing them into one place that is supposed mm -hmm. to, by its very nature, be a peaceful place because there's no other cities to to war with anymore. And of course it becomes a powder keg, mm -hmm. right? Where it is going to blow at any moment and we are starting to see that happening with this murder. Of course, I am not familiar with all of literature. I'm not even like, I'm not even fluent in all forms of comics. But to me, I feel like this is a new, fresh approach to the fantasy genre. And then also this post-apocalypse idea where it's like, okay, we got through the apocalypse. We're fine. How do we now restructure so that we can all live together? I think that that's just interesting to me. And then Phaedra, as a main character, being like this compressed version of all of the conflicts, where she is an ex-royal, she is a magic user, she is a skeptic, she is a person with a real life where she has exes and she has a partner and, and she's looking for this like work-life balance. And she is also throwing herself into her work, to into being a black cloak, being this detective, as a way of keeping her anxiety and her kind of unsettled feeling with her past at bay. Who does not relate to that? Yeah, totally. And I think that's a good enough setup for this conversation. Lisa and I have read the first three issues, but we really keep the conversation focused on the first issue, which is available now from Image Comics. Seek it out, read it digitally, get the physical, wrap your mitts around it. Like I said, it's nice and thick. You <laughs> like it. And uh, on that note, let's just get into this conversation with Kelly Thompson and Meredith McLaren. Kelly and Meredith, welcome to Comic Book Couples Counseling. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to talk about Black Cloak because this first issue is a massive issue. It's 50 plus pages. It feels like an event. Image Comics seems so hyped over this series. Why was it important that this first issue come out in such a massive way. I actually think that's sort of just a practical thing that happened to us because so this big image book that we're doing Meredith and I have been working together over the last year on on Substack which is like a digital newsletter platform and we've been publishing parts of Black Cloak like behind a paid you know reader thing and when we were first doing it, because it's digital comics, we weren't sure what size pieces people were going to want to read in. So we were like, oh, are we going to do five pages a week? Or are we going to do 10 pages one every twice a month? Or like, well, how do we want to do it? And so I was trying to keep the writing really fluid because we were still sort of deciding. We were like feeling it out as we went. And then the readership that we'd accrued at my Substack, they really voted sort of overwhelmingly that they would rather read it fewer times, larger chunks. So we were like, okay, that's easy for us. We'll just go back to the model we already know. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was cool, but it meant that to get the best possible number one, we might want to rethink like where that ended. And so we ended up with this huge oversized number one, which is really exciting, especially because this week, 
uh, my partner picked up uh, Chroma, which is a really beautiful new image book that came out this week. And I got to hold it in my hands and I counted the pages because I was like, oh, I think this is like how big we're going to be. And I think they perfect bound that one and we'll be saddle stitch, but it feels really good in your hand. I think you'll be excited, Meredith. Go pick up Chroma. We're, we're the same like this, Chroma. <laughs> All right, Chroma is an awesome comic. It's really, really good. We were talking to Meredith before we hit record and she mentioned what Black Cloak is a murder mystery and you are keeping Meredith in the dark and I want to know why. <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't actually know that was true although I do have the last two issues of the first arc. I finally took it from all my notes and like plotted it and gave it to our editor. And I, I did that a while ago and I didn't give it to her. And I don't know why I didn't do that. It's I, okay. think, I think, well, I mean, you definitely want a partner on this stuff and Meredith's a really savvy, smart storyteller. So I only have things to gain by sharing it with her and letting her help me and make it better earlier. That's always a good thing. I think it's a little bit, there's a thing sometimes, especially when you're running behind, where then you you end up getting to surprise someone with something within the script, your artist or your editor or something. And um, I don't think it's a great situation to be in because you're behind in that situation. You haven't been sending your outlines in properly and everyone knows everything that's coming. But there is a lot of joy in the surprise. And maybe I was just thinking with those last two issues, like, we come so far this way maybe I should just go the rest of the way but that's not true because especially for the very end Meredith and I have a lot to discuss about there are a couple directions we can go after the sort of you know exciting finale of that arc so we'll, we'll be talking about that if we can get through the 5,000 interviews we've scheduled uh, we'll talk about <laughs> it I promise. yeah um <laughs> And I think it does help though with the art because it's like it feel the when it's a new idea to me it feels a little fresher in the delivery. Well there's also a thing that again it's probably a mistake because Meredith is very savvy and anytime I share things with her she makes it better um, but there is a thing that's happened on Black Cloak in particular where if I had just plotted it clean really before we started I think there are a lot of side trips that Meredith and I have sort of taken together, knowing that we didn't have, because we were publishing it on Substack and that we were going to do image eventually, that's really freeing in the sense of, oh, you only have 20 pages, you know, so there were some things we were able to do that I don't know that we ever would have done if I had actually turned in the outline as I should have, like, there's a lot, there's a whole, there's stuff with the mermaids that we got into much more that we probably never would have done if I had gone with that hard outline from the beginning. But like, you know, Meredith, Meredith tends to draw characters and then I go, oh, that's my favorite character now. Let's make that <laughs> a bigger role. So that happens a lot and it's a little dangerous, I guess. But, you know, things she did after especially in those in those first world building issues where we're establishing so much stuff she did just really inspired me to like change the story quite a bit and so I think maybe subconsciously perhaps I didn't want to turn that off because that's been a real joy of this series that we've been able to approach it a little differently and a little more like loose you know and um i mean it's a murder mystery so you can't get too loose but <laughs> well, we still gotta have clues and we still gotta keep you know things together but well and also i think having the the pathway diverge a little bit is a little more honest in the idea of how an investigation goes it's like sometimes you go down streets that lead to nowhere <laughs> yes yes absolutely i think that's completely true of a detective story. I think that's also true of like my favorite kind of books and novels. Like not everything is like exactly a plotting, you know, like you could probably take this section out of something. And I'm like, oh, but that's my favorite, favorite section. Like it brings so much color and, you know, interest to what you're doing. You know? Kiros is such a fascinating environment and it's populated with so many different types of cultures and uh, beings. Be beings and 
when you are setting out on those initial issues, and I'm, I'm really curious from Meredith's point of view, like how much leeway do you have to establish? Like, do you have the, like, these are all the cultures that can be in Kiros. This is the strict guidelines. Can you have any freedom to insert creatures that weren't necessarily there in the script? Kelly hasn't said no to me yet. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think I think our first no is coming because Meredith drew basically the cutest, most comic book accurate or movie accurate uh, last unicorn in a crowd scene. It's adorable. And uh, we don't have a standards and practices department over at my house. And so we might she might have to tweak that unicorn. But yeah, I am. You know, it really. I mean, we do still have the problem that almost every narrative created by humans has where your main central characters are a little more human looking. Um, But I said to Meredith right from the jump, I hate it when you've got this great fantasy world and all the main characters are just look like humans, maybe with ears, funny ears or something, you know? And so I said, I would really like us to populate out um our world and you know we can go to the to the regulars on some things like elves or whatever but i'd like to sort of let's subvert some things and create some of our own things so dracona was something that as far as i know we've invented like i mean i'm not saying it doesn't exist anywhere else but i'd never seen it before and that's sort of like a an ancient dragon hybrid species. And then uh, we created some things that I, we ripped off, I ripped off from Meredith's uh, Instagram where she had drawn this skeleton that was like on fire. And I was like, what about these guys? Are they, can we, do you want to, do you want to put these in the world of Black Cloak? Like, let's give them a name. We call them death shards, you know? So it's been super fun. We created, she created, we created this smoke monster that's like a, it's basically like a shifter type of a character that's mostly gaseous, whatever. So yeah, we really started playing with it and having fun. And and then Meredith goes absolutely nuts, which I'm sure is fun, but also incredibly time consuming on like crowd scenes and stuff for people we haven't even met yet. So it's uh, it's been really fun. I think there's a thing where you want it to be your pure thing and it is a comic book and it should exist as a comic book, but it's hard not to be at least a little aware of like you know oh i'd love this to be you know a a, a cartoon someday or a movie or whatever and be like i some of the things we're doing are making it really hard to make it into a movie or tv show that isn't animated but it makes the world richer and so i sort of don't care yeah and and you kind of have to make things for the media you're in too exactly exactly like sashenka would we ever create you know a sashenka design if we're like oh yeah some actor someday is really gonna play this role like it's an impossible (laughs) costume it's amazing yeah no that's if it ever goes anywhere else that is for other people to figure out (laughs) well when i look at these panels and when i look at these rooms i mean they are densely populated with all kinds of characters you sense the freedom that must be there to create those panels yeah no kelly gives me a lot of leeway <laughs> so i'm like whatever i'm feeling that week it's like yeah I, I try not to overwrite but i mean honestly i you know it's one of those things where you know every writer artist relationship is collab is a little different and i don't like to um to brag or you know whatever but i i do think meredith and i are quite well matched like occasionally i want Meredith to say a bunch of things to me and I get like a a cute smiley face back but like that you know she would just sometimes rather just speak with her work and so you know and I Meredith is actually a really incredible writer as well uh she probably doesn't need me at all (laughs) so let's I need you so much Kelly but um but I think she does sort of in my experience you know I don't have 
a sort of visual cue to go to that's not my instinct but she is just like a very visual person and so you'll write a bunch of words and be like well what do you think are you okay with it and then you'll just get like a little winky smile back and you're like okay Meredith's happy moving on (laughs) so it's like a very we're very good at just sort of doing that together and um I think she gets me and she gets where I'm going she's also well aware of my bullshit at this point like she knows I'm gonna ask for another color pass on certain things she started sending me I know she thinks she's tricky she started sending me like a page for a scene and being like these are the colors I'm thinking of doing what do you think before I keep going and I'm like yes okay or sometimes I'll be like oh whatever and she's like all right so she's very she's very cognizant of my little peccadillos and she's found really wonderful ways to like turn them into the best possible thing and it's it's exciting to work with her she's incredibly talented she brings stuff to it that I could never bring I think that's why I make the joke about her not needing me I hope she likes doing with this this with me but you know when you're working with someone with Meredith who can also write her own material it's impossible to not be really cognizant of how lucky you are to have that person doing that for you because I can't she might be able to do what she does without me I can't do it without someone like her so it means a lot that she'll set aside her very valuable time and work on these projects with me it's a big deal Oh, Kelly, Agreed. I don't know that I can say anything that's nearly <laughs> as nice. Uh, right, just me, because I'm not... Send me a winky later. Okay, I will send you a winky later. <laughs> I am, like, literally, like, blushing. Like a, like, a creative partnership is such a romance, but built into that is that the romance is potentially fleeting. So as it is happening, you are, like, clinging, clinging to each other, and I, like, love it so much. Um, also, it's like a great way to make the work better because if I don't turn in something Meredith's interested in, she's just going to do something else. So like, I've got to work to be worthy of her time and attention. And I think that's good. That's good for all of us because it makes the work better. Yeah. And that's definitely uh, a sentiment I share. Like Kelly turns in these really beautifully, um, fleshed out characters and it's like I want to do and environments and I want to do them justice you know my imagination was ignited by Black Cloak like from the opening narration this idea of this last city that is supposed to be this place of peace after vanquishing a great evil is now just kind of like simmering with discontent of people i guess who are like bored turning in on itself yeah yeah like what was the inspiration for kiros so i the idea basically because i don't like to do like you're never gonna read like well hopefully you're not gonna read like a wall of exposition for me i hate that i don't want to read it myself i don't want to write it for people i like on a world building sound like you're never going to be like getting a prologue or a big thing with me because i like to just drop you in and like as if you crash landed on that planet and like let's learn as we go we're not going to get especially i made a conscious choice here we don't really except for that first page we don't really have narrative captions uh so there's no one to be like hey this is dracona and here's what they do and like you know press play for more whatever like it's not like that it's just like you're in it and you're learning on the fly what's this person what's this person what does this look like and it's a complicated world so you're not going to know everything but I think we're very careful about giving you what you need as you go and then it leaves all these really great sort of nooks and crannies unexplored um I've forgotten what the original question was which I had a really great answer to so that is super great oh well I think you covered it I think we're good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there, what, but what did you say you said something specifically that I was well, the thing that made oh. me immediately start dwelling on what this world could possibly be about is the idea that without a great evil right. all of the other millions of little evils will start growing yes. legs and yes. walking around that, okay yes. exactly yes and that is exactly that's a great question it's why I wanted to get actually to the question is that so I think because I don't want to tell a lot about the world one of the fun ideas that I had here in the world building I think was that we all know these fantasy stories right where all the world has to come together to defeat defeat the one big bad but those stories almost always end when they win 
And so this is sort of like, okay, they did all that. Your favorite fantasy world, whatever it is, this is just like that. And they won. They beat Saruman, whatever, whatever the thing is out there. They did it. But they only came together under a common enemy. And now this world has been at least partially destroyed. This is purported to be the last city on earth and everyone's there trying to make it happen, but you know, they don't all get along. They all have different habitats and different ways they want to live. Some want to be up at night. Some want to be, you know, up during the day. Like it, they're, they're as different as you could possibly be. And like, they're all sort of trying to make it work, but like coming to the, coming to that world and like having to build rules that will fit everyone is sort of impossible so the black cloaks are basically the detectives of the police force the police force being a completely new concept for this kind of a world where law and order hasn't ever had to encompass everyone before you know because before it would have been oh humans and villages here and fairies often wherever they live and you know so bringing them all together under one roof is like not going well <laughs> i mean it is in the sense that they're alive but it's it's got all the problems of any society of, of diverse creatures you know they don't want to get along a lot of them you know yeah the story, and the infrastructure is yeah. crumbling yeah yeah <laughs> the story is a mystery there's an investigation it's a procedural. i yeah. love a procedural it's a, obviously in a fantastical world it's also and without like going further beyond the first issue there's also romance and relationship mm -hmm. issues that we're exploring and you know we're comic book couples counseling this is what we are here <laughs> for i want to see people kiss we're massive <laughs> fans of you know kelly on rogan gambit yeah. gem and the holograms had some great stuff like can you talk about wanting to explore what seems to be at the center of this mystery a, a specific relationship hmm. uh, and why you centered it that way and what you want to get out of romantic entanglements and stories. So there's not as much romance in this as I was hoping. I think it was, I think it was just issue four or four that we finally got some kissing for Essex back in on the page. When we sort of dance around it a little bit um, and we do explore her past some, um, there's basically a flashback or a flashback equivalent in each issue. Um, you learn right from the jump that that Essex, who's the one of the two main black cloaks, Essex impacts, that she is of elf blood and was exiled mysteriously, that she was a royal and that she was exiled. And that's why she has this job. And that's sort of why who she is. But it's all sort of unsaid. But yes, we're sort of excavating that. It all very much ends up tying to the story. She is basically the ex-betrothed of the murder victim. And so it's like a very personal case for her. And it digs out all her old stuff that she's just been I don't know that she's been trying to hide it but she definitely hasn't been dealing with it I mean I think her take is well I just moved on with my life and I'm you know making the best of it but it's a this is a case that is sort of both bringing out nope that's not going to be satisfactory like we're going to need to see everything that happened here and we're going to need to understand what happened here because it's all tied to sort of whether Kuros survives or fails, like um, pretty directly tied to it, actually, some of the mysteries. Uh, the mystery of, of who killed Freyal and all of that that happened, I mean, that wraps up in six, but it takes us all the way to the edge because I think as you discover pretty early on, I mean, Freyal's murder seems to be like it's covering something up, like this is not an easy man to kill. So there's definitely something going on. And uh, I hope the resolutions of that, I think they're, I think they're, I think the, they're big. I think, you know, it's like when you watch an action movie, even if you really love it these days, don't you go, I wish we'd had one less of those like little action <laughs> set pieces, like just, you know, and then maybe I wouldn't have had to pee during the movie or like, but you know what I mean? Like, you're just like, just a little bit less. And so I feel like because I've been in comics that have like a really strict formula, I feel like we're breaking out of that a little bit where 
I just want to tell the story without being so slavishly devoted to sort of these page counts and the formula, but that doesn't mean I don't want to go big at the end, you know? So we're driving to a pretty huge finish that I think is much bigger than the sort of more procedurally stakes of the issue, month to month issue. Like it builds to a really big climax that I think is going to really I think people are really going to enjoy it. I hope so. This is the part Meredith doesn't know. This is why she's. <laughs> I mean, she knows some of it. I I hope, but she doesn't know. She's probably like, oh yeah, good. I hope I'm I I'm draw. gleaning what I can. <laughs> you know? I hope I want to draw those explosions. No, I, I don't. <laughs> I do want to draw explosions. Yeah, it's going to be big. It's a big deal. I feel like one of the ways that you are defying formula, like storytelling formula is that Phaedra has more on her plate, I would say, than a usual fantasy character. Generally, a fantasy character is like two or three things. You know, he's an orc, he's a cleric, he's a father. Like, that's like what you get. And she has like so much going on, but she's kind of hiding it all under this big category of, well, I'm a black cloak now. And I find that so relatable. You know, we all actually do live these like really messy lives and we do try to like simplify by going like, yeah, but on top of it all, I am this thing and this is who I am. Yeah. And um, like, did you ever feel like, man, so two question, Kelly, did you ever think, man, I'm really giving her a lot. And Meredith, are you like, man, she's really giving her a lot. <laughs> um. No, no, I've never been like, this is too much for this character. I think part part of that is me going, she's an elf. She lives for a very long time. She yeah. has a very storied life, you know? Which honestly, I that's one of my biggest complaints about the, the book. Um, and it's a complaint. I, I mean, it, we're not alone in this, but I do feel like that the long age thing it rarely gets handled as well as it needs to. And I include us in that. I've tried to put things to address it, but like, especially because we're doing flashbacks where we're seeing her younger, it really makes it hard to quantify like, well, what do you mean? It's been 20 years and you look the same age. Like, I, I just think it's a really weird thing for like human beings to process, even as readers. Like we just don't think enough about, um, we don't think enough about how much that would shift your perspective to be a kind of creature that lives for hundreds of years. I, I was watching that fellowship of the rings, whatever the hell of rings of power, whatever it's called. And they, oh, had yeah. a great, they had a great bit in there between the dwarf and Alron. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, I've forgotten the dwarf's name where he's like so mad at him because he hasn't seen him for 20 years. And he's like, I'm sorry, man. That's like a summer, like in his mind, yeah. it's like, he's been away for a summer. And I thought that was a great moment that really talks to the unrelatability for us of that and how much you have to emphasize that. And I don't think we did a great job of that in this book because we were focused on other things like making sure we, you know, roll out this backstory and make her relatable and all that stuff. So, you know, you can't, you can't nail everything. I wish you could. Um, I think that, I think, I think Essex actually loves being a black cloak. I think she's particularly good at it. And I think she loves the life she's chosen for us. Um, but we happen to be meeting her, but that doesn't mean she wanted to be exiled and she'd right. love to be able to see her mother and like not be thought of as an enemy if she goes up to higher levels. But I think that we're meeting it or her at a particularly bad moment in her life where it doesn't look like she enjoys much of anything. So uh, I will say that the face of it for her is dramatically going to change. Like things by the end, things by six will be, the end of six will be dramatically different for most of our main characters. Um, it's a pretty big shakeup that's coming. And uh, if you like Retta, who you guys haven't met yet. Maybe. Yeah, we have she'll, met her. I have a okay. question about Retta. Okay. Yeah, so she'll be back too, which again, that's an example. Look at Meredith. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> she <that's> introduced, <laughs> Kelly introduced Retta and I'm like, I love her and I want only good things to happen to her from now on. <laughs> and she put up this promo art of her just that she just done on a fly because she loved the character. And I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, this is how it happens. 
Rena, the, the ending of six, the ending of the whole first arc is completely different because I created Rena and Meredith fell in love with Rena and Meredith made an incredible design for Rena and Rena became a thing in our minds and she became something different. And I love that. And again, if I had had like an outline that I was absolutely religiously devoted to, I don't think that happens, you know? So I'm going to try to be more flexible in the future. Well, what uh, maybe, I maybe a halfway point between what I did here and what I'll do in the future. Yeah, I think I think we've we're, we're working towards a pretty good compromise. Yeah. What I love about the first three issues that we've read is that there is a lot of plot going on, you know. But as as you said just a little while ago, there's not a ton of exposition. There's like an introductory chunk of exposition, and then it's just conversation and character. This is a character comic. It's a relationship comic, and those are the types of stories that we love so much. It is watching the story grow through how certain characters interact with each other similarly and differently. And again, I just want to go back to this idea or this question of what you get out of seeding so many different types of relationships through the mystery. Well, I just want, I just want it to feel so big. Like even when you don't have time to go into every nook and cranny, like we haven't, you know, there's no way we've had that time. We've been focused on this story and these six issues and, you know, you build out as much as you can, but there's a limit to how much you time you have to build that out. And so I, so I know we don't have time to explore all those things yet, but to me, every time we hint at one, that's a whole other thread we've created now. So like the club run is at, um, what did we end up calling it? Oh, I don't, uh, the crux? Crux, yeah. Um, I almost called it sticks, which was what we, what I called it in Heart in a Box. And I was like, that's either a really fun callback or uh, I'm out of ideas. So let's call it something different. Um, and so we did the club and then we've got in issue five, chapter five, the, the new one we're doing, there's a there's a, a video arcade that, that Meredith did in these incredible Blade Runner blues and, you know, neon blues and purples. And so it's like now at the seventh sign, I think I called it or something. Yeah. She drew this great logo. So like now we have to see that again. I'm going to have to draw, I'm going to have to write something for that because it's just every little new neighborhood Meredith, show, I suggest, and then Meredith fleshes out, like it seems like a place I want to go and tell a story in. And so, I mean, Char, she's just constantly exciting me like I just give her a prompt and she you know she turns it into a thing and then I fall in love with it and it's a it's a sort of uh, it's yeah. a cycle here I I kind of feel the exact same way where it's like every time Kelly gives me a script it's like oh I'm getting a gift <laughs> and Meredith do you imprint on these characters as you're drawing oh, yeah. their adventures oh yeah no there are a couple characters where I'm like if anything happens to them I will riot <laughs> My Rena related question. Rena pops up in the third issue. So I'm not going to say any like spoilers. What I like about her immediately is she is a little bit of like a, a skeptic of the whole like black coat procedural thing where you go like, okay, we are in a world of infinite magical possibilities. And the idea of solving this crime is far fetched and ridiculous. How are we even supposed to do it with someone with infinite? access and infinite powers so how are you going to do it then <laughs> Ren is right how are you going to do it then <laughs> well so um I can't totally I can't give away the idea that um that Essex has had that that conversation gave her like that conversation ends very abruptly as you guys remember mm -hmm. and like Essex goes to make a phone call because I think Essex hears that sort of mini speech that Rena gives, which is more of like yelling at someone. Um, and she really hears her and she knows she's right because Ren is talking about, and I actually had to fight with our editor a little bit about this because he's like, he's like, you're, he's like, you're really undercutting yourself by saying 
you know, she doesn't know who she was talking to because how could she know? And I was like, yeah, but that's the world we built. I was like, it is hard. It is hard for them to solve crimes. It is a problem that someone can come and talk to her and we don't even know. I mean, we have a world of shifters, people who can turn into other people. Like, so she has to acknowledge that who or what she thought she was talking to maybe isn't the thing, but maybe isn't what they really were. But to me, the bigger get in that scene isn't her reminding Essex and all of our readers hopefully that like magic is a really big deal here hopefully it's the bigger deal is her reminding them that she is poor and that she has no power and that she lives in a world with a fucking queen Mm -hmm. and so why does she think she can do anything and that is the more important message of Kiros I think I like I don't think the elves are just like horrible horrible rulers but there's corruption there's always corruption there's always a problem and especially in a world where you have absolute haves and absolute have-nots the way we have established this i mean we've basically taken you like a world model and tried to scale it you know into kiros where you've got the one percent living literally on top of everyone else and that's a problem and that is the bigger problem than magic for essex and pax and and for the world of kiros and i think rena very correctly points it out which is what sends them to where they go in the next issue and Essex's idea about why it's a why it's a a scoop isn't the right word but like why it's an angle that might work to get around both magic and politics and uh, political power so we'll see So (laughs) it's obvious to us reading the comics and talking to you now that there is a massive world that could be explored for a very long time. So you've got the plan for the six issues, but it seems like there's a plan out there for many more issues beyond that. I think it honestly just, it's, I'm going to let Meredith answer it because it really, it really depends on Meredith. No pressure, Meredith. Oh, no, no. Um, (laughs) first i would say yes <laughs> and then she, has, she has a lot of great stuff coming up so you know her schedule is pretty pretty crowded and it's a lot easier for me to write it takes a lot more time for her to draw so it's really going to be in her court i'll let her answer that um but really early on uh like i think before issue one was done we were already talking about like the advantages building a sandbox like uh, Black Cloak gave us where we could def- we could branch out into other genres as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were both really excited about that. And I'm still really excited about that. <laughs> so well, that's, that's awesome to hear because she's right. I mean, I think I have a ton of ideas for this world. I don't want to, I don't want to speak to to Meredith's amount of ideas or interest in the world, but I I think we've certainly done enough to hook that. And we do have a couple really good ideas in addition to just what you'd sort of expect, which would be like a sort of continuation of this story series, but she's right. There's a ton of branches, like something we were talking about before we even started this project was an unrelated sort of siren based mm. thing that yeah. I was, uh, that I wanted to do that was inspired from a drawing Meredith did just on her own for her one of her great kickstarters that she did with the monsters and I was like oh man can we just do this little like a one-off siren project together like I would love to do it and that we were talking about that when this sort of happened and I think we just agreed that that siren project would just be in the black cloak world now if we did it. And so I think there's a lot of future stuff here. Uh, I think some of it is certainly dependent on success. You know, if it's, if it's a great success image and the money's coming in, then we can fund more to do. Um, If it's, if it's a medium success, then we can probably do some more, but we probably can't do everything we'd like to do. So, you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit of a, you know, like a, like a slowly cooking stew here and we'll see what we're allowed to throw in, you know? Um, but I hope we're going to do a lot in here. Uh, that heaps certainly. the responsibility on us. Yeah, like if we want more comics, yeah, 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 we yeah. got to start recommending it yeah. to everybody. Which buy more comics. Get out there. <laughs> Please buy this comic. Well, it does feel like a book like Saga or Hellboy 
where you could go away from it for a while and then return, you know, every couple of years with a new trade paperback. I mean, I do think that is a model that is great and would be great for us. I don't know that we can compare ourselves to Saga, despite (laughs) despite the solicits of things. I do think I do think we're a good comparison to that, just because of the kind of characters they're doing and the kind of stuff they're doing. But you always feel a little silly when you're like, "Oh, it's like Saga," because what is this the most famous, popular, (laughs) beloved comic of all time? Oh, yeah, we're just like that one. We We just like like them. Jonah Staples, we're the same. No, uh, it's not the same. We're not them. Um, and you know, listen, if we can get even a fraction of the success Saga has, we will be very happy, I think. <laughs> well, the first issue comes out January 11th. Uh, like we said, it's a huge issue. Anytime you get a yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Great it's a price. budget size, Costco size <laughs> issue of a comic. And it's always like a blast to get one of those, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. It's like a weighted blanket, you know? (laughs) It's the weighted blanket of comics. It's just (laughs) just take the fantasy and set it on me and just let it slowly push me into gravity. Feels so good. I love it. I love it. Uh, and thank you so much for hanging out with us and chatting with us about it. Uh, we'd love to have you back on when we can talk more beyond yes. the first few issues. You want to talk all of the spoilers. Into all the spoilers, yes. Uh, but until that happens, where can our listeners find you online to continue this conversation? I hear there's a Substack. There is a Substack, and since Twitter is real questionable now, let's just say the Substack is uh, 1979semifinalist.substack.com. And you can find out there's actually a Black Cloak tab if Black Cloak specifically what you're looking for. So, uh, and there's actually some, you can read a preview on there. Even if you don't have a subscription, there's a free preview up. So, uh, you know, check it out. And Meredith, I hear pretty great Instagram account to follow. And Tumblr. Yes, yes. Um, Tumblr is meredithmclaren.tumblr.com. And then Instagram is a name (laughs) I greatly regret choosing <laughs> um, uh it's iniquitous fish always wondered uh it's i n i q u i t o u s f i s h i chose it before i thought about any kind of like potential promotion of myself in the yeah. world um i, I my young tw- child <laughs> i was i was so naive my twitter <laughs> And all of my socials are the, my screen name that I came up with in middle school and I still use it. It's sidewalk siren. It's so (laughs) dumb. And yet I just keep, I I won't let it die. If I come up with a name when I was a kid, I think it would have been worse than sidewalk siren. Siren, (laughs) Um, I like it. It's a little I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to district choir. There might be a boy there. I need an email stat. (laughs) Did you guys, let me ask you, Meredith, did you guys try to get your name and it was already taken or that was just, I you think I, you'll be clever? <laughs> no, I wanted something along the lines of Wicked Fish or something. Mm. Back then, astrology meant a lot to me and I was a Pisces <laughs> and whatever. Um, uh <laughs> not anymore i was oh yeah no i i've transcended (laughs) my astrological sign um no uh and i think that was taken and so i'm like well i'll go to the thesaurus (laughs) that's how i found it yes that's how we make superhero names so i mean you you weren't wrong but uh yeah great decisions Okay, Kelly Thompson was obviously taken. It's not a unique name in any way, shape, or form. So I didn't really have a choice, but I'm pretty happy with my decisions. Maybe I should set up a consulting business because 1979 has worked out well for me. You know, they have consultants for baby names. It can't be that (laughs) much. Oh, man. Uh, Meredith, Kelly, thank you so much again for chatting with us. Have a wonderful day. You as well. Thank you so much. And there you have it. Our thanks to Kelly and Meredith once again for coming on the show. Wasn't that just the literal best? They're so cool. I love that moment in the conversation where Kelly is talking about 
fighting her editor because the editor wanted things to be a little more clear. And Kelly's like, no, the world of Black Cloak is confusing. You know, our world is confusing. And if you were to throw magic into it, it would be utterly insane. So embracing the questions is what Black Cloak is all about. And I think also the theme of like, sometimes you have to do hard things on principle. Yeah. Like, even if they can't solve Frail's murder, it's that important that someone is trying to. Yeah. Like, and sometimes we have to do things that are impossible because it's the right right thing to do. And not worry about what the reader is desperately trying to clasp at. Subverting our expectations is the delight of narrative. Mm -hmm. And ultimately the reader will be rewarded by wading through the confusion. Yeah. The conversation of our Brad and Lisa science people or magic people is going to come up yes. like, and like to me, that is such like a multifaceted question. It's going to be coming up in our Lazarus Planet episodes, which will be our next episode. But clearly, like it's like stuck in my craw. Yeah. But like as a reader, I don't go towards fantasy stories where something can be solved by a spell. Right. Because to me, I feel like a spell is like cheating. Right. You know what I mean? Like, well, like a Hermione Granger every time she's like, well, I was just randomly studying this perfect spell that works right here. And um, I always feel like that. Well, like that's just like a sweep of the leg of the reader because then I don't get an opportunity to solve it. You, you rebel know? against it. I do. I do. But I think that like to point at that thing and go like for every solution that we have, the bad guys have a solution that is even more dastardly and they are also operating independent of principles, you know? Yeah, and Black Cloak does do that thing that Saga also does where you have this fantastical thing that is just wackadoo and let's not worry about like how that actually works. What's important is how that is affecting the scene for the characters right? and their internal lives and how the magic becomes a metaphor for the extremity of the emotions that they are going through. Also to reference another book that we love, like thematically um, the idea of doing things that we know we're going to lose at is sometimes the right thing to do it is also like a theme and do a power bomb. Yes. Where it's like, okay, like I'm going into something that I know is not going to, to necessarily end with win, you know, maybe success for me is not on the table, but it is important for me to fight this fight. Yes, yes, absolutely. So please seek out Black Cloak from Image Comics. Issue one is now available. Uh, they're also publishing this on their Substack, so mm -hmm. give their Substack a perusal. Links in the show notes to that and all their socials. And yes, as Lisa has mentioned already, our next episode is going to be a big Lazarus Planet celebration, the DC Comics event in which science and magic collide and Batman is confused. I accidentally used the word crisis <laughs> in the Mark Wade interview and I'm still cringing about it. Yeah, so it will be a conversation with Mark Wade, who is kind of the architect behind the event alongside Gene Lu and Yang. So it does provide us an opportunity to celebrate Monkey Prince, one of our favorite yeah. new characters characters in the DC universe. And we will also be chatting with Nicole Baines and Leah Williams about their assault on Krypton stories. And that conversation is really special as well. So be on the lookout for that. And Lisa, I think we can also go ahead and announce, even though we haven't had this conversation yet, but there will be an episode in February that is so crazy exciting for comic book couples counseling. Can we announce it? Can we tease it yet? Um, well, you know how I feel about announcing interviews that are not yet in the can. Okay. Like anything could happen. Yeah. Um, between now and then. Okay. And so I I vote. Yeah. We'll go with not, your vote. To, 
I vote to not spoil it. Okay, all right. So <laughs> the tease <laughs> is we're very excited to have this conversation, and it is a conversation that has already triggered so much anxiety in Lisa. I am so excited. It seems impossible. I am not going to be able to speak. And I think if you are a longtime Comic Book Couples Counseling listener, you know what property and comic we might be talking about. So that's it might all relate. The... It might relate to my pinned tweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the biggest tease that we're going to do. Go see Lisa's pinned tweet, which is at Sidewalk Siren on Twitter. And then, of course, we're going to spend the rest of this three-day weekend reading The Last Ronin and preparing for our final Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sibling conversation. So now it's the time to catch up on our three previous TMNT episodes. Yeah, do it. Okay, Brad, you have mentioned everything that's on my plate. I am officially feeling totally overwhelmed. <laughs> so I think I'm going to throw myself into my work, and my work is going to be being a black cloak. I'm going to solve okay. magical crimes in magical times. Where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show posters, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You know I need them. I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter and Hive. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to get exclusive, Ooh. you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Hive Social at CBCC Podcast. You can give us the gift of five stars in Apple Podcasts. And while you are there, you can do an act of service. Yes, Why please. not write a review? Yeah. I said that different, but it's still the truth. Still true. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages it really warms our hearts and helps the pod so until next time friends keep your love tank full and your psychic rapport open you are now in session with the comic book couples counseling podcast you like wait until i'm like clearing my throat and you're like go <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're gonna clear your throat i might as well clear my throat <laughs> stinger no